Welcome to Never Shut Up. It's your boy Marcel Swag. Damn, my Clippers got smoked last night. Hell, Minnesota come up in here with. <laughs> Make sure y'all come up in here with some love for these itty bitties, man. Go to projecttransition.org. Leave a monthly donation. Support the community. Great efforts. Great things are being done out there in them streets. All right, let's get into this right now because Nick Saban, he walked out of his coaching position. And now he out on them streets. Retired. Bought a $17 million house in Florida and said, Peace, you NIL punks. <laughs> he mad at college football right now because it has changed over the years. Don't listen to me say it. Let's listen to Nick Saban talk about the state of college football right now. Hmm. How much what? did the current chaos and state of the law contribute to your decision to retire now? Well, all the things that I believed in for all these years, 50 years of coaching, no longer exist in college athletics. So mm. it's always was about developing players. It was always about uh, helping people be more successful in life. Uh, my wife even said to me, we'd have all the recruits over on Sunday uh, with their parents for breakfast. And uh, she would always meet with the mothers and uh, talk about how she was going to help and uh, impact their um, sons and how they would be well taken care of. And she came to me, you know, like right before I retired and said, why, why are we doing this? And I said, what do you mean? She said, all they care about is how much you're going to pay them. They don't care about how you're going to develop them, which is all what we've always done. So why are we doing this? So, you know, to me, that was sort of a red alert that we really are creating a circumstance here that is not beneficial to the development of young people. And I, I want their quality of life to be good. I think, as I said before, name, image, and likeness is a great opportunity for them to create a brand for themselves. Um, I'm not against mm -hmm. that at all. Um, but to come up with some kind of a system uh, that still can help the development of young people, I think, is paramount to the future of college athletics. I love what Nick Saban said there. Even though everybody felt that little pinch, Right? Whether it was the optics, all these old ass people, white people, and you're like, mm hmm. You're talking about 50 years ago. You liked how it was then, and that's not what Nick Saban was saying fully. What he was saying is back then, we had a singular focus, which was come here, get better, and get out of here, and hopefully go to the next level. It's not like that anymore. There are more variables. Uh, NIL has come into the equation. Uh, what do they say? Money is the root of all evil? No, it's not. It's actually the love of money <laughs> is the root of all evil. And I think that's what Nick Saban was trying to say. He just wants to purely develop players. That's it, man. Fuck the rest. I don't care. Just want to develop players like me. I would love to go back if I had the body and capabilities to play football. That's it. Don't ask me about coaching. No, no, no. Don't ask me about an executive position. No, no, I don't want to be a GM. Nothing. Only thing I want to do with the game of football is either play it or be a fan. That's it. I ain't got nothing in between. And I think that's when Nick Saban hit. He hit that wall. He was like, I ain't got nothing in between. Y'all got me over here seesawing between developing players and just paying, tricking off so they can get theirs. And that's the system right now because it's the wild, wild west. Nothing wrong with the players getting paid is how they're paying the players. Here's a couple of things. They have competing rooting interests right now. The coaches, uh, Nick Saban type of coach, and the players. Because the players are going after anybody who got one penny more than where they are. They're looking at it. Oh, you don't like it here? 800,000? All right, I, I just saw in the transfer portal, 801,000. Hmm. I do like Boise. You know what I mean? They're just thinking like that. And nothing wrong with that except it doesn't root you. Money is the root of all evil. No. Love of money is the root of all evil is the entire structure, the entire scripture. So these cats are out here loving what's next. So that's part one of the problem, for real. There is a system that needs to be put in place so these kids stay still. Second part that's a problem is Hey, these cats, not only are they chasing the next dollar everywhere they go, but the way that it goes on the team, only the top dogs are getting paid. It is top 
heavy. The mother cats, they getting more than they ever got before, but they ain't getting enough to be always chasing the next dollar. So you basically got a upper class and a lower class, and then the lower class is trying to obviously go upper class, so they chasing a lot more. Well, Caleb Williams left Oklahoma. If Lincoln Riley didn't leave, no. He was just going to stay there, right? But that situation, that's a top player now. How many top players are dipping? Rare. You ain't going nowhere. I don't care. I'm a, I just stay here and get more money. So it's the other cats. It's that lower class, I'm trying to say it nicely, that is chasing, trying to get more. Nick Saban, like, this is too much babysitting. This is a problem. So... I'm not siding with Nick Saban in the sense of players, let's cap them. Players, let's take their money away. Players, let's get rid of NIL. I'm siding with him in terms of let's root these players in something more than just money. They, let them get paid, but don't root them in money. You know what I'm saying? Like, have a job that you love and you're getting paid for. Not, oh, I'm only with this job for the money. You know how that usually turns out for anybody, including you. You're chasing money, not what you're doing. You ain't going to like what you're doing. And then those around you ain't going to like doing it with you. And that is Nick Saban right there. So y'all tell me what y'all think of Nick Saban's decision relating to the changes in college athletics and NIL. He could have did it in a different setting. <laughs> Let me stop. <laughs> y'all know, as soon as I heard 50 years and I'm seeing Ted Cruz, I'm like, ooh wait. All right. This is going to get interesting right here. Uh, you agree that players care more about payment than development. You think that's true? Or did Nick just put that on the players? Players like, I want to be developed. But I want my bank to develop too. Make that account hook up. So uh, y'all see a problem with this and why? Beat it up in the comments. Let me know what you think of Nick Saban and those comments. All right. Let's get to this one right here. Oh, man. Cat Williams. Remember the interview that set the world on fire? I think number one interview ever by, what, two people in it. Uh, he beat Joe Rogan's interview Shannon Sharp did with Cat Williams. Congratulations. Uh, 61 million, I think, last time I saw. Golly, 61 million. <laughs> Shannon, Shannon, 61 million? Good Lord. All right, so Cat Williams, one of the things he said that people were like, mm, I don't know, dog. I don't know about all that, is that he said he ran a 4-3, 4-4, Okay, and then we saw him somewhere in some jeans and Timberlands taking off. We didn't see a time with it, or no, we did see a time with it. And the cat said four, four, seven. Now I can't lie, it looked like cat was moving, but the angles, you know, 40s could look like 38s, 38s could look like 35s. I done cheated the system enough to know. Uh, it looked a little weird, but I was like, yo, he's still boning out, he's still moving. Y'all still say boning out? That's how we grew up saying it. Now, there's another video that just came out, and this is going to be interesting. Let's just watch Cat Williams bone out again. Let's see him take off. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, get your ass. Okay, 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 okay. okay, 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 okay. Yes, there we go. Let's go. It's go time. Give me that. Give me that. Let me see that. Let me see that. No. They didn't want to show it. He did it. Uh oh. Oh, he did it on the iPhone. They all doing it on the iPhone. What's wrong with this generation? Y'all ain't got to stop watching. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Now, y'all know I done ran a few 40s in my life. Uh, let me just say this uh, a 497, if you in your 40s and you just came off the streets around a 497, you doing something. Under a five is moving. Right now, I could not run under a five. Hell no. Nope. You could train me up to the. Nope. I think when I was training and I raced Keyshawn Johnson, if y'all remember that, we had a marquee race at the LA Coliseum. First time we raced, I tied Keyshawn, photo finish. I really beat him by a little, but they didn't have the photo finish perfectly. They had all these weird angles that looked like his foot crossed. Well, my torso cross, people know they don't know track, don't know what they're talking about, blah, blah, blah. I ain't trying to talk about that. We raced again, I smoked them. Then we went back to the first race. But I can tell you this, when I was training for that, I, was, I think I ran a 5-1-2, something in that world. I did not break five. Keyshawn didn't break five. So running a 4-9-7 right now ain't nothing to clown. It ain't nothing to clown. 
Only if you said you ran a 4-4 and now you're running a 4-9-7 or a 4-3, we got something to talk about. That's why we're going to talk about it. Um, Cat Williams. <laughs> Could he have ran a 4-3 when he was younger, before the weed and all? I don't know. During the weed? I don't know. In his 20s? That's tough. I, 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 don't, I don't see a 4-3 in that. I'm not saying he lying. I'm saying that form right there, them knees were just way, way too high and stiff. Like, like he was rock or bottom. But he was moving. But this is not how you can tell somebody is fast. Not in the 40. I'm going to give y'all a cheat. This is to help Cat so he can actually go get it. It's who takes the fewest steps. That's the one who's going to get there. If you watch the 40, it's, it's a fluid motion that is calculated. Not robotic, but calculated. So when we were doing 40 training, they were like, look, I need you to run this 40 in 17 steps or less. Now, the or less wasn't emphasized because then you start reaching, you pull your hammy, and more than that, you start going slow in your turnover. Hey, hey. And you see how Cat was kind of, arp, arp, that. Now, he got little legs, so I know he ain't probably going to ever get 17, but the point is, it's a fluidity to it. Cat didn't look like that was uh, fluid, <laughs> as it could be. He was moving, though. He faster than me. Don't get it twisted. But I'm like, I don't know about that. So, any of y'all want to get out there and run a 40, let me just give you, I guarantee you, run your 40 right now. All right, you run it? Go, go outside and run it. Two, three, four, five. All right, you back. Hey, now, this is how you run faster without even getting faster. Front foot, you got to use that as explosion. I'm talking about, it's a piston. In your head, you say set go. In a 40, you don't let nobody say set go. If you thought somebody was going to say set go and you in a 40, it ain't really a 40. That's what happened in the marquee race as well. Stupid. Carry champion. Oh, what's wrong with you, girl? <laughs> Love you, girl. All right. So put your hand down. Get that lean. Get that thing and sit in your head and throw that, that the opposite arm, the one that's not in the ground. Yeah. But throw it out. Don't throw it up. <laughs> you throw it up. You coming up. You slower. Second thing, make sure that front foot does not move. Piston, whop, to the ground. Bang! I mean, it's... And then that back leg, whop! And then that back leg has to have the flexion. And this is so important. People don't get this in track. This is why track people are so big, so good. This is a spring. And the spring does not go like this. The spring doesn't do that. You don't get on your toes. You... You already own them thing. Them thing lock. What? 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 Seventeen of them. You good? <laughs> as fast as you gonna run. I guarantee. you, Go back outside now. Now run. Do that same thing I just said. Out. Piston. Keep that thing. What? 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 And that's why. Yeah, I know you didn't get that much faster because it's hard to do. You know what I mean reps? You got to get at that. But y'all know y'all talking to a, a national champion in the sport of track. Not only a national champion in the sport of track, but national record holder. Where are my trophy? Somewhere, somewhere in this house. Somewhere in this house. I got national. Fool, shut up. I hate when people, somebody walking to me talking about they fast, fast. I'm like, what? you got a national record? <laughs> I used to go get it, but I, I can't go get it, but I know how to go get it. And I can tell you that right now. So, Cat Williams, um. Look, you ain't going to ever prove to anybody you used to run a 4-3 in your 40s or whatever right now trying to go out there and dip. That's hard. Only T.O. T.O.'s the only one who has fought father time and right now has fought him to a draw. He ain't winning. Nobody ever going to beat father time. But T.O., Tom Brady, <laughs> took him to a draw. So I like to see that. So tell me, uh, which time you think was accurate? You think Cat was 4-9-7? I think... That looked faster than 497. I ran a 481 at the combine or 87 at the combine at 272. A month later, weighing 282 on that LeBron, let me stop. Uh, <laughs> I ran a 461. Come on, man. It's a variance. So. To that point, Cat Williams could have ran it a lot faster, but they clowning. You know they ain't going to give Cat his flowers right now. So tell me what y'all think. Cat faster than yo? 
<laughs> your favorite player, cat faster than you. Uh, did you think he ran faster than 497 or you think they clown him? All right, let's get to this sound right here. Let's get to a conversation with Dr. Umar, who has <clears throat> been a brand and has become a brand that is really talking the narrow black experience, but he makes it wide open. And he's captivating to me. Whatever he's talking, I'm like, let me hear this. Now, he reminds me of In Living Color. You remember the dude in Living Color? Like, My brother, let me just tell you this, the sophistication. Like, he, you know, he going to go there. He going to hit you with some of that 5 percenter feel. Uh, he going to hit you with the corner New York style. Um, but he does say some bombs and some jewels, right? So tell me what y'all think about this. He was sitting down with Nick Cannon, my guy. Sorry we didn't get gold in this year. So here's a little sidebar. I coach uh, basketball, Phil Belichick over here, and Golden, Nick Cannon's son, was on our team for the last two seasons, back-to-back -back championships. This year, they wouldn't let us get Golden. Somebody drafted him before we can get to him. I love that little dude. The little dude just turned seven. Shoot threes. For real. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I love you, Golden, man. We'll see you on that court. We're going to wear you out now. All right, so listen to this. Dr. Umar Johnson talking with Nick Cannon, Golden's father, about masculinity. Let's hear it. Did I go wrong? Did I do something wrong by wearing a dress in my younger years? I want to quote one of our elder grandmaster teachers, Professor James Small. Mm, grandmaster. Yes. He Hello. said in response to a question about movies, media, and entertainment. He said, all content has intent. Mm. See, when see, you I sit down you. and watch mm -hmm. an hour and Drop 45 jewels. minute long movie, right. and you know this better than most, being the successful actor you are, everything that you saw on that final cut, from the color, to the background objects, to the pictures, to the clothing, to the conversation, to the symbolism, everything had a purpose in communicating <laughs> the overall message of that movie. Yes. So if we will admit that entertainment is a weapon of indoctrination, mm -hmm. in an age where we see a war against not only the life of black men, but the survival of black masculinity, mm -hmm. how can a black man putting on a dress not be a problem? I would bring it back to everything that I just said. Mm -hmm. What is the issue? <laughs> like, and again, what does that mean? By that, that means you're telling me you have an issue with <clears throat> understanding the feminine within the black man. But I want us to make sure we draw Ooh. a distinction between feminine energy and female sexuality. Mm. Because when you mm. spoke earlier about <laughs> yeah, being yeah, secure yeah, yeah, in yeah, your yeah, masculine yeah. and being able to entertain your feminine, I can respect that. Right. But we're not talking about entertaining the feminine because we all have that balance within us. Right. But masculine and feminine energy is not the same as, as sexuality. male sexuality and female sexuality. So, for example, certain uh, feminine trait, patience is a feminine trait. Absolutely. You see that tolerance is a feminine trait. So when Dr. Umar Nurturing. says, absolutely, I can step into my feminine to nurture my queen. Right. Merch, nurture my children. Right. I'm going to step into my masculine to provide for my queen and protect mm -hmm. my children. Right. But when we talk about female sexuality and the I, images, absolutely for children who consume more television per capita than any other ethnic group in America. So the messages you put in those movies are going to hit our children 50 times harder because they're more dependent on television than anyone else. And they're less likely to have a father at home, Nick. So you're talking about a black male role model who took me this far in my life as a masculine example. And now you're going to put this on, which is now going to force me as an innocent child to entertain all of what can come from putting on that dress. <laughs> Y'all feel like me right now. Where the hell did I just go? Oh, man. Um, One, y'all remember watching Boomerang and Martin was like, yo, do you know the game of pool? 
is really like a, a racial display where you got to have the white ball go attack all of the color balls and then it ends when it knocks out the black ball, the eight ball, right? And it just felt like a lot of those beats, but much deeper, um, even though that was pretty deep. Uh, I don't care. Let me just get this out the way, because sometimes I bury what I'm really trying to say, because I like talking in radio. This is TV. <laughs> y'all ain't really listening to me. Y'all watching me talk. I don't give a damn if you wear a dress. Really, I don't. I don't think. You know why? Because I am a believer that the origins of wearing a dress was not based on your sexuality. It was based on the social customs and what became a social norm. It was something that was inanimate. Somebody finally put it together. Girl, what that t-shirt long? What's that? This is a dress. Oh, you gonna wear it? Yep. And then the dude was like, oh, let me get one of them. No, no, no. And then it was a while where they were wearing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then they go back to that. Point being, stop making these objects like really determine who you are. Like, it's silly because you know you can go somewhere else with that same object and they're going to look at it completely different. Give you an example. When I was growing up, I saw my uncles out there cripping. I was like, damn, look at my uncle's blue rollers and stuff. I didn't know they were crips back then. I just thought they loved blue. Anyway, look at my uncles. I'm like, oh, they fresh, got cutlass, all that. Like, yeah, yeah. And then one had an earring. And I remember he had an earring. I was looking down, I was like, oh, that's fresh. I'm going to give me an earring one day. You know how you start thinking when you look up to somebody. You don't even tell them. You're like, oh, I'm going to give me an earring one day. Then I'm like, hmm. I was like, uncle, why you only got one earring? Like, I think he broke or something. Like, you ain't slanging enough, fool. He like, no, nah, men don't wear two earrings. That's for girls. Uncle, did you just make that up? <laughs> I ain't done. So I'm like, all right, that didn't make no sense. Your ass ain't got the dough to get both earrings, do you, own? Now I can start looking at other dudes, toothpick in their mouth, spitting out some policies, and one earring. I was like, oh, boys do wear one earring. Girls, they wear two. Then I start looking, you know, you go to class, and you start looking in them world history books, and you start seeing them film strips. See, I'm old. Film strips. And I'll be looking at like some Africans or something, I'm like, wait a minute. How many earrings he got? <laughs> he got earrings. Big old ones and stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute. You wear it. So then it starts, you gay if you got earrings uh, as a dude. Nah, you ain't gay if you got one earring. Nah, then all of a sudden you get two. Because dudes was getting two. Like, forget with this gay talk. I'm supposed to look like something because or be something because I got an object in my ear. Then you go across the water. They got all kind in their head. So you know what I did when I got older? I'm confused as hell. My uncle, is he gay or gangster? He got one earring or two. I don't know. Fuck. I end up getting five piercings. I went straight to Columbia, 125th Street. I remember right there in Harlem. I'm sitting there and the lady's like, what you want? One, two? I said, five. And she said, five. I said, two, two, and then one up here. And I said, never mind. Don't put that up there. Just... <laughs> And she was, I'm like, that shit hurt. Because she was like, up here, you sure? And I went like this. I pinched it with my fingernails. And ah, nah, nah, three, two. Then got a nose ring. Can you still see that little hole? Tupac in it. Tupac is still good. Oh, man. I had six piercings. Whatever you think I am, I'm not. <laughs> so what are you talking about? So when I see somebody with a dress, especially in a role. Look, if you ain't raising your kids, can you calm down on how I need to raise them? All y'all out there, shut your ass. Look, you ain't loving yourself, loving your family enough, and it's on me to do it? I hate when people, somebody said this, and this is real. Don't use me, oh, it was a, a Vince Staples. Don't use me to try to make you love yourself. Bring me along for your hateful ride, right? Yo ass ain't loving you. You ain't got the connection. Everything I do is not based on helping you, raising you. Now, I think there's a collective responsibility. Be a role model. Yeah, be a positive person if you can, right? I love being that way. However, because I'm that way does not obligate everyone to be that way. Why? Because that's not reality. Reality is to make a battery work, 
A battery got a positive side and a negative side, and that's how you get the juice. That's how you get electricity. Did I just sound like Omar and Bishop? <laughs> no, you got the juice now. That was the worst ending for a movie ever. So the point is, I'm looking at this like, talking about reaching. A dress makes you gay. No, 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 no. Wearing a dress in a role because Hollywood would only make you wear it if they were really trying to indoctrinate these kids. I watched Miss Doubtfire. They didn't never make me want to go around here. <laughs> Ain't your mama. Like, uh, what y'all doing? It's silly. This is a really silly argument. Really makes you, this is one of those arguments that you look smart only to dumb people. <laughs> you, you wear a dress and this is what it is. Now, if you telling me there's some sorcerer or some, some, some mighty devil in the Hollywood CEO saying, wear a dress, and then he goes, ha, 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 he's going he's gonna to mess up the world. Show me him and give me that conversation on tape. Other than that, shut y'all asses up. Wearing a dress? Now, I will say this, because I don't like to be one-sided. I don't give a damn what I believe. When I go to like NBA games and I see them cats be walking in, <laughs> I'll be like, what? You know why I say what? Because I wouldn't do that. I'm not saying what, oh, he, ooh, when he leave here, he gonna mess with his teammate. I'm saying, I ain't wearing that. But I ain't fashionable. I ain't no fashionista. I sweat too much. I ain't got the right curvature. I'm big. I'm trying to drink. I'm spilling it. I ain't Gucci down to the socks. Nope. <laughs> Those days are one behind me, young, younger, and two, I actually judge people who put too much into their clothes. <laughs> but that's a me problem. That ain't a them problem because there are a lot of great people that I know head to the toe. I'll give you one example. My uh, advisor who's a CEO, VC cat, Asian cat, every day something different, crispy, collars all big like this, just tight. He a, cra he a great, cool cat, smart guy. Nothing weird about him, except he likes to dress every day. <laughs> I think that's weird. Point being, man, if we're going to really go there on this, let's go somewhere. Uh, I like Nick Cannon just saying, look, you must have a problem with just feminine being a part of the masculine experience. And I like that Umar corrected him, said, no, I'm talking about what it results in, whether it's for the kids or that person's masculinity. But you can't grade somebody's masculinity, right? This is a stupid grade. Like, you know, like when we try to say, oh, he black or he blacker, that's a stupid grade. We play the stupid games and we get stupid prizes like that. <laughs> Like, oh, he wore a dress, and then it's a kid at home who watches way too much TV because his daddy ain't home, so therefore now you wearing a dress gonna make that boy think he gay, or he gonna be gay, or he just gonna be less masculine. What? I watch the Dukes of Hazard every day. I have not, I never missed the episode of Dukes of Hazard. I ain't racist. <laughs> they weren't either to me. I didn't know what the General Lee flag was. I didn't know what the Confederate flag was when I was eight. Point being, I watched a gang of it. I watch different strokes. I ain't get richer. <laughs> Y'all need to stop with this TV. You ain't poster guys. Y'all saw too much poster guys. Ooh, the TV is gonna make me be like that. Man, shut it. Every time I listen to more Ice Cube than Ice Cube made. I I know more songs from Ice Cube than he made. <laughs> and I ain't killed nobody. But here's a little something about a man like me. Come on, man. Stop playing with me. Y'all need to start looking in here and stop looking out there and blaming everything. Stop looking out the window. Look in the mirror, damn it. Hey, uh, they said this. They did it. Mm. All right. Let me stop talking before I contradict myself more. <laughs> All right, y'all. So tell me what y'all think of this. Man, with the feminine black man. Oh, fuck. I like the fact that there are feminine black men. Why? Because most people assume you yeah, ain't nothing but tough and hard and gangster. Aggressive. Pick a side. Oh, everybody think we aggressive and hard and, and tough. Then the next thing you know, you're like, oh, we look at feminine and stuff. Can you have it all? Yes. What he's saying, colors, I'm going to leave y'all with this. Hey, hey, let's run down there and get one of those. The OG said, nah, let's walk down and get them all. It's okay, dog. Take y'all time. Let us grow as a culture. Let us expand as a culture and do it all. Get it all. Ain't got to be like, oh, this is the only way. And I hate that, that whole, this is black and this ain't black. I don't like that. 
I don't like country guys talking about the hood. I don't like hood dudes talking about the country. I don't like hood dudes talking about the burbs. I don't like burb dudes talking about the hood. I don't like none of that. I'm like, dog, tell me your experience. I want it all. I want it all. So tell me what y'all think about that. And y'all agree that these kids are being mesmer mesmerized by the team. My son loves Minecraft. He ain't tore down none of the walls in here yet <laughs> to build Jack. I always tell him, I say, that's not reality. Even though that's a great game, cognitive behavior. Not reality. But that's maybe Umar's point. You there to tell him. Most of these kids don't have them. Interesting. Let's talk to it. All right, coming up next, I'll never shut up. I'm going to funk up some comments. I'm going to hit you with a while is. I'm going to get up out of here. I got to get these kids dressed. I'm playing pickleball today. Y'all know me. <laughs> Let's get it going. Love for you guys, man. Let's do it. I'll never shut up. Breaks TV. Reese TV. I'll tell you, my uncles, boy, they had me fooled. I didn't know what the hell to think about them earrings. Welcome back to Never Shut Up. It's your boy, Marcel Swatter. All I think about is itty bitty hooking them up so they can run the city, hooking it up. All right, go to projecttransition.org right here. Get this book. Why? Because it supports the itty bitties. So then I hook you up. Let's funk up some comments. We were talking about Mike Tyson. He had to fight Jake Paul. Ah, and I went physics. I went uh, ageism. I don't think Mike going to win this one. I don't know if he's going to lose, but I don't think he's going to win. You know what I'm talking about. So here's somebody saying the same thing, basically. In a legitimate contest, Mike Tyson would destroy Jake Paul inside of a round like Marvin Frazier, I guess. Problem is, this exhibition will be a fixed exhibition. Hmm. Expect the fake in this fight. Preach. Another comment said, thank you, Wiley. Much love. All right. You're welcome. What did I give you? Uh, <laughs> ditto. But damn, I would love to see that uppercut side step ribs combo. Ding, ding, ding. Ha <laughs> ha. God, I would love to see Mike go in there, hit him with them bully ball, boom, 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 boom. them bully ball punches. Boom, 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 boom. Then he hop, wop, wop, wop. Sleep. Go to bed. Night, night. <laughs> I would love to see it. I love to see it. I just don't think I'm going to see it for many reasons. They may rig it that way so you don't see it. Uh, someone else said, I hate that this is happening because I feel like Mike will lose and he is in my top five favorite athletes ever. Yes, Mike was losing to subpar fighters 20 years ago. In his prime, obvious, Tyson literally murders him. But I am afraid he doesn't win this one. Never hope to be wrong more in my entire history as a sports fan. Mm -mm -mm. I hear you. It's funny when I was doing that take, and I still feel this way, I can't let it leave my lips that Mike Tyson is going to lose. Ah, I'm done with them comments. I can't believe that Mike Tyson may lose. Like, even when he was losing at the end, I was like, every time I was like, nah, am I going to win? <laughs> kind of like when you saw Dion at the end of his career, you're like, oh, Dion got him. Dion going to cover him. And, and then you're like, oh, he got scored on. All right. He got the next one. Yeah. Like, you just can't let go. Like Nick Saban, talking about 50 years ago, <laughs> Mike Tyson was the, and you're like, ah, that ain't the same guy. You're like, oh, but that's how I got it. That's how I got into the game. That's what it's always going to be. I'll tell you this. I was watching them videos of Mike Tyson. Oh, he's still quick. Uh, he's still powerful. But you get, you get, even in your greatest shape, you'll have the same elasticity. You ain't as tight. And if you ain't as tight, guess what? It ain't as explosive 
And you can make things in practice look great. That's why every single NFL game, go to the, the next NFL game that starts at 1 o'clock, get there and be paying attention. Don't be in a fucking snack stand. Don't be eating. Don't be drinking. Don't be on your phone. About 12.20. Watch all them dudes warm up. It's unreal. <laughs> Got their headphones on, their wristbands and stuff. They do a drill. Everybody looks like an all-pro. Blow the whistle. <laughs> Blow the whistle. Goop! Kick the ball off. All of a sudden, all them all pros go. <laughs> like, it's about three left. <laughs> they are gone. Gone. It looks great in practice. Warm-ups, mitts. Ah. I don't know what's going to happen, but I hope. I can't even say it. Mike going to lose. Ah, I don't know what's going to happen. All right, y'all know how we finish every show with a Wiley ism. Yeah. Put the Wiley ism up because I don't even know what it is. Hook me up. Damn, when you need some help, you don't ever get help. Look at this. <laughs> what is today's Wileyism? Um, I'm going to find it. There it is. If you don't risk anything, you risk even more. I knew it. If you don't risk anything, you risk even more. Mm. Do I need to say more? <laughs> Golly, that hits home, right? <sighs> you got to roll them dice. Let me give y'all something behind the scenes going on and. It feels like I'm going to the NFL again. I'm um, having some really big conversations around the foundation. Uh, that's in support. And that means like human capital, people supporting their resources, their networks, but also some checks being written. Like it's about to get real around these parts. It's weird because I had to like change my mindset in terms of like the risk model. Y'all know I done had a cool life, right? Because I played football, even though I wish I played in the NBA, but hey, <laughs> sorry, God, I, I ain't mad at the gifts you gave me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I could have been 6'8", God dang. Uh, but here we go. So I played football. Then I go straight to like NFL Network, ESPN, Fox. And then it's like, oh, what you going to do? Then it's Brinks TV and the foundation. Oh, interesting. Okay, it's going all right. And then it's like, well, you got to risk it, man. Going to Columbia, risk. Uh, leaving uh, mainstream, risk. L leading your life with a foundation, risk. <laughs> and man, man, man. Conceive, believe, achieve. But you got to risk it. You got to go out because it's just weird. Like the game of life is played like, no, nah, I ain't telling you everything. You can feel confident as you want. It can look a certain way. If it is. It's like an NFL game. Some games, you're like, man, it's two minutes. They down 14. They in. It's wrap. Oh, fumbles. Whoa. Okay. Oh, they only down eight. Missed the extra point. Oh, whoa. What happened? Pick six on tie. Overtime. You win on the field goal. Like, man, it's crazy. So just believe in yourself, man, and go out there and get it. But this world is for the taking, but you got to go take it. <laughs> you, that's another why this, you ain't going, they ain't giving you jack. So people who don't get it, part one of the problem is you ain't going to get it. You got to take it. You think they're going to give it to you? So that's why every time I listen to somebody, I'm like, it's on you too. Like, whatever they say, yeah, 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 coach tripping, yep, yep, yep. Oh, man, this school sucks, yep, yep, yep. Oh, man, it's bad over here, yep, yep, yep. It's on you, too. Um, you just got to think about it. That battery, to have the life that you want, the battery you're going to need has a positive and a negative. That's how it works. So if you don't risk anything, trust me, brother, trust me, sister. You risk even more. That'll do it for today's episode. Never shut up. Love you guys. Ah, have a great day. Um, pickleball today. Got some good dudes coming over here too. I hope I wear their ass out. I've been practicing. My server getting better. Love you guys. Serve it up today. Go get it. <laughs>
I'm so inspired to be here and thank Shine Global for this award, uh, to be recognized for doing the right thing, to be recognized for doing good things and trying to inspire others for their own greatness. Um, I'm just a kid from Compton who uh, at an early age had to look inside to find my opportunities because on the outside, there were so many whispers and sometimes yells of, I couldn't make my dreams a reality. And I thought that was very unfortunate, but I was thankful that I never internalized that, that chorus that was around me. I was a kid that understood that you had to be greater than your greatest excuse. And I had a lot of excuses. I had a lot of reasons to have self-doubt. But I was able to develop my inner power, discover that inner power, and make sure that I showed the world exactly who I wanted to be. And it was really simple for me. It was to make my dreams a reality. There was nothing more to it. And as I now stand here, just a few miles from where I grew up, where that adversity still is strong. And as we see through these movies, that it's worldwide, not just in our locale. You see the, the suffering, you see the gangs, you see the drugs, you see the poverty. And there's always one common escape. It's that inner power, it's that ambition. It's having a voice that's louder than those surrounding voices. And I'm on a mission, a global mission, to make sure that that inner power inspires all to not only give, but to receive the blessings that come from giving. And I'm up here right now as a guy who's challenging everyone to give their three T's. That's time, that's talent, and that's treasure. Human capital, financial, whatever it may be. Let's invest in each other because we all have to coexist here together. And as I look around and I have a foundation that, that really inspires these kids to become their greatest version of themselves and to look in the mirror to make sure that they're greater than their greatest excuse. It gives me my greatest passion. Uh, I was a kid who wanted to be a school teacher, but because of my height, weight, and speed, I became a football player. So <laughs> I took the helicopter ride up as high as I could, but as I was ascending, I never forgot that I was once one of those fork and roll kids who was shot at many times, who had to navigate around adversity every single day who had to waste so much of his brain power just trying to get home every day. And so many experiences that sometimes you become desensitized to. But in reality, that is someone else's reality. So I'm so thankful to stand in front of all of you guys as, a, as an example of the kids that we're trying to affect, the underserved, the underprivileged, those who are told that their hardships are greater than who they are. But hopefully we can inspire them all to look inward because everything they want out there is already in here. Appreciate you guys. BetUS, America's favorite sports book, where you can bet on everything, anytime. Sportsbook, casino, horse racing, live betting, and more. We have the best bonuses in the industry. That's right. Get a 125% sign-up bonus, and to celebrate our 30-year anniversary, we're giving up to 30 risk-free bets, a truck, Super Bowl tickets, and more. Don't miss out. Play smart. Join now. BetUS, where the game begins.